What's going on, Rock? How's everyone doing? Man, man, man. I miss you guys big time. I miss you big time. I am so excited to share the word with you, but nothing will match the excitement that we're all going to feel when we can all be in the same room and worship together again. Amen. Listen, I, I, I sincerely hope that you're doing well and that you're sheltering in peace today. Yeah. Let me pray for you as we get started. Father, we adore you. Thank you. Thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have to meet in whichever way possible. Lord, we thank you right now, Lord. I thank you just for the opportunity you give me to speak to your people. Lord, we recognize today that, uh, that worship is uh, the submission of all of our nature to you. That it's the, the quickening of conscience by your holiness. It's the, the nourishment of mind by your truth. Lord, it's the, the purifying of imagination by your beauty. The opening of our hearts to your love and the surrender of our will to your purpose. And all of this, Lord, gathered up in adoration. And so, Lord, we, we thank you and we ask you to meet us here. Please speak to us today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. You know, if I can be honest with you and transparent with you, uh, I've made it through this shelter in place order pretty decently to this point. Uh, there hasn't been a whole lot that's gotten me down except one thing. I think the one thing that's been tough for me is the underrated uh, absence of sports on TV. I, it has been much harder for me than I can even articulate to you. It's been pretty tough. And so I've been open to watching uh, more movies and series on TV than probably ever before. And so you guys got to you got to pray for Amy a little bit, because, you know, if I ever when, when all things are normalized, if I ever have the, the opportunity or the choice between Netflix and chill or NBA basketball and grill, I'm going to choose the latter almost every single time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the absence of sports, it hasn't, uh, you know, been all for naught. I think uh, early the early innings of uh, this order, I really felt like early uh, God was. Uh, was really leading me through this process of just engaging more with my family. I felt like uh, he was instructing me to to kind of lean into family life and to be more present with my girls and and really to be more attentive to my wife's needs, wants, and desires. Um, and, you know, I even came up here and I preached about it. If you remember last time I was up here, I talked about family, right? I talked about marriage when I got up here. And so I got out of that and I was like, okay, well, you know, my lesson from the pandemic was, you know, that I need to to kind of get you know, closer to my family, bada bing, you know, check the box off, move on. B but then the next lesson came. And Amy and I, so we, we sit down and we start watching a series that was recommended to us. And we get three shows into this series. And I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. Like, I, 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 like, I don't know about you, but I find it very, very difficult to watch someone spiral downward. It's just really hard for me. You know, I, I see enough of that in real life. So for me, it's like, you know, I, I don't need to watch five seasons of this. And so we're watching this series. We, we kick this one to the curb. And then we start watching a second series. Now, this one's amazing. This one's super entertaining. The storyline is phenomenal. But the main character in this story keeps finding themselves in these, uh, these just unbelievable, like, like these just next level stressful situations for me. And I would find myself days later still being upset and troubled over the stuff that was going on with this character on TV, right? And that's when I felt the challenge of the Lord. That's when I felt uh, the Lord uh, really challenged me. Here was the challenge. The challenge was, you know, you spend a lot of time, you know, making yourself look good and, and uh, cleaning yourself on the outside. But will you submit even your inner desires to me? That was the challenge. Listen, the, the challenge was, Sean, will you live on holy ground or hidden ground? And then in my, my devotional life, I came upon the book of Joshua. And in Joshua chapter seven, something happens in the Valley of Achor that really pieced all this together for me as I was trying to reconcile it. And so that's what I want to share with you uh, this morning. I want to kind of share something uh, that I'm learning really in my own devotional life. So Joshua chapter seven, starting in verse 19, it says, 
Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, truly, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. And this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful robe from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them and behold, they were concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. They took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with them took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And they stoned them with stones and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this day. Now, there's another area in scripture where the Valley of Acre is uh, talked about. And so I want to share that with you as well. Hosea uh, chapter two, uh, starting in verse 14. Now, this is God talking. Okay. And God says, therefore, behold, I will allure her. Bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Now Joshua has just led the children of Israel out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And one of the first things he does when he gets into the promised land is he has to cross uh, the, the river of Jordan. Okay. So he has to cross the Jordan river and he does so on dry ground. He gets everyone across. So he has his Moses miracle moment and he gets through the Jordan river. And one of the next things he does after he gets there is he sets his sights on his first battle, which is with the people and city of Jericho. Now it's interesting to note that God gives him specific instructions and a strategy for how he's going to fight this battle. But not only does God give him a specific strategy of how to fight the battle, God also gives him strict instructions of what to do when the battle was over. Okay, this is what God says. God uh, gives him these instructions. He, he, he says there's a ban on this city. Everything is devoted to destruction. Everything. Destroy everything. And if you covet their stuff, if you take their stuff, you will bring a curse on Israel and you will bring trouble on yourself. Sounds like pretty easy instructions, right? And so this is what they do. They go in, they march around the city, the walls come tumbling down. Uh, they destroy everything in the city except one man, Achan. He disregards the ban and he takes some plunder. From there, God pulls back his presence. God pulls back his power. God pulls back his protection and the children of Israel, they go into their second battle with another city that is much smaller than Jericho against an army that is much smaller than Jericho's army and they get routed. And so as they're trying to reconcile what's going on with them, God isolates and through a process of elimination shows that Achan is the reason. Now, when I was a kid, I saw a movie that was traumatizing. All right, now, now maybe you, you know this movie. It's called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. The creepy, creepy movie. Okay, now I guess it's a, a morality tale. You know, in this movie, there's five kids who are lucky enough to get a golden ticket that gets them admission into the Chocolate Factory. And what you see is that four of the five kids have this, this, these major flaws that end up being the reason why they get ejected out of the factory. All right. One of the children, one of the kids uh, that are in the factory, his name is Augustus Gloop. All right. Now, Augustus's flaw was gluttony. It was good. Now, now, what is gluttony? Gluttony is taking something good, something necessary and cramming it in 
until we're sick of it and ready to explode. That's what gluttony is. Now, 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 this is not a knock on anyone who's been overeating during the shelter in place order, right? Like, like if, if you're feeling convicted because you've added on a COVID-15, like that, I, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not, I'm not trying to shame you in that way. You know what? I, I sure miss you guys' courtesy laughs. I really do. You guys are generally pretty kind to me when I crack bad jokes. All right. But, but uh, if you remember Augustus, he, he's in this factory and they're all walking around checking out the factory. He runs over to the chocolate river and he gets to the chocolate river and he starts drinking from the chocolate river and everyone's trying to get him to stop, but he won't stop. And then he falls into the river. And after he falls into the river, he gets sucked up into a pipe and he gets ejected out of the factory. Listen, we all have an Augustus gloop in us, right? We all have an Aiken in us. And whatever your sin of choice is, whether it's gluttony or covetousness, no matter what it is or anything else, every single sin shows us something about how sin infects and affects all of us. That there's something in all of our hearts that we crave or, or, or have the proclivity to crave inordinately. Sin has affected our hearts in such a way that our desires are disordered. And, and, and good and necessary things become cravings and yearnings. St. Augustine uh, called it this. He called it concupiscence. <laughs> that, that we all have this, this infection, this, this disorder in us. Sin, in other words, makes all of us addicted to something. To something. That's what the story of Achan is about. That, that we're all in the grip of craving in some way, shape, or form. That, that, that we all crave something immoderately. Now, I, I want to show you three things from this story, because I think this story shows us these things. I think the story shows us, number one, the depth of our craving. Number two, the structure of our craving. And number three, the healing for our craving. Okay, so the depth of it, the structure of it, and the healing for it. Amen? So but let's start with uh, the depth of our craving. Now, when Achan takes the spoil from Jericho, he knew exactly what he was doing. Not only did he know what he was doing, he knew what it could cost him. And he took it anyway. When Joshua confronted him, I want you to pay attention to what he says. Joshua confronts him and he says, yeah, I did it. Now notice that he doesn't say, what? You're going to do what? This is a capital offense? No, no, no. He owns it. He owns it. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that our craving, our, our heart's desire for things is so strong that it overcomes our consequence, uh, our, our, uh, our, excuse me, it overcomes our conscience. It overcomes our reason. Eventually, it overcomes our fear of consequences and even our own sense of self-preservation, right? Sin so affects and infects us that we can crave something so badly that's what Achan did. It was suicide. It, it, it was suicide. Achan uh, it is, is an example of what sin craving does to the human heart. It takes good and necessary things and disorders them. All right, so that's the, 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 the depth of our craving. Okay, the first thing. Second, the structure now of our craving. Now, I've been trying to make the point to you. Uh, that, that we all have desires in our hearts. We all have cravings for things that are, are good and necessary, but we have the ability to disorder them to the point that uh, they become not only no longer good for us, but destructive, okay? Now, th the point from desire to destruction um, has a predictable pattern in it, all right? Destruction doesn't just kind of pounce on you typically, all right? To, to, to quote the great poet Meek Mill, there's levels to this, okay? There's levels to this. All right, so when in, our inordinate desire and craving meets our opportunity for indulgence, there are four steps to the cliff, all right? Aiken said this, Aiken said, I saw, I weighed, I wanted, and I took. All right, I saw, I weighed, I wanted, and I took, so let's look at those for a second. First, I saw. Now, the word saw here um, isn't necessarily translated as notice as we think it would be. It's actually better translated as behold. Now, what does behold mean? Behold means look, 
look, look. Okay, behold means to hold something. It means to put it in the center of our attention, to gaze at it, all right? And so the first step to temptation is to move beyond noticing and gazing. And in doing so, you open yourself up to the next step, which is weighing, which is weighing. Now, think about for a second what Achan did, what, what, what he saw, okay? Achan saw a beautiful robe. He saw 200 shekels of silver and he saw a wedge of gold. Now, the question of the day is, how did you know how many shekels were in that bag? Well, I noticed there were 200 shekels. How did you know there were 200 shekels? Like, like, like it's one thing to notice five. Like you see it. That's what you got to do. And so what Achan was doing in this moment, he was giving them, the, the theological term to this, is he was giving them glory. All right. Now, the word glory in Hebrew literally means weight. But in a spiritual sense, it means importance, okay? And so what Achan did is he knew about the honor of God, all right? Achan knew about the honor of his people. But when he waited on the scale of his heart, his inordinate desire for other things weighed heavier. They won out. He gave them glory. And whenever you give something glory in your life, you will serve it, even if it's a corrupt master. He'll serve it. This then led him to the next step. He said, I saw, I weighed, I wanted. Or in other words, I coveted. Now, what does coveting mean? Okay, coveting, uh, it, it's more than just desiring something that doesn't belong to you. Now, it is that, but it's more than that. Uh, uh, to, to, to covet is to worship that thing. It's to adore that thing. And so whatever you glorify and ascribe weight and glory to uh, in your life and in your heart, you will worship and you will allow it to draw you to it and you will be drawn to it, which led him to step four, which is he took them. He took them. This right here is the structure of how we go from desire to destruction. This is what our cravings have the ability to do with us. And so here's the point that I'm trying to make this morning. And this is what I feel like the Lord uh, was speaking to me. And this is what I'm trying to articulate to you is that Achan cherished the things that were devoted to God more than he cherished and was devoted to God. And the consequence for his false worship was that he became what he worshiped. He became devoted to destruction. See, Joshua said to Achan, because you brought trouble on us, the Lord will bring trouble on you. See, Achan died to remove sin from the camp. Achan was cursed. Achan was dragged out and made a spectacle. He was burned up by fire. And through his death, God's presence, God's power, and God's protection was restored to Israel. See, the story of Achan is one of the best pictures in all of scripture of the wrath and fury of God against sin. And it also shows us exactly what Jesus came to do for us. See, Paul in 2 Corinthians says this about Jesus. He says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Or, or if you would allow me uh, to, to rephrase it this way, Jesus, who was nothing like Achan, became Achan so that he can make us right with God. See, Jesus endured trouble so that it wouldn't have to be poured out on us. Jesus died, not just to remove sin from the camp, but to remove even the strong craving of sin from our hearts. Jesus was cursed. Jesus was dragged out and made a spectacle. Jesus suffered the fire of God's wrath on his body. And because of Jesus did this on the cross, you and I can enjoy God's presence, God's power, and God's protection today. See, uh, we all as sinners deserve the fate of Achan, but Jesus is willing to exchange that fate for a free pardon and take your place. And though you and I, on our own, are a people devoted for destruction, Jesus has come that we may hide in his holiness. See, though our hearts are prone to choose hidden ground, Jesus places us. He places us on holy ground. And so here's where uh, healing from sinful craving comes. Here's where it comes. That if you made your way from I saw 
to I weighed, to I wanted, to I took. And your life is falling apart because you've gone too far. You can repent. God says, I can turn your valley of Achor into a door of hope. So you may have already been stoned and burned up because you've progressed to the place where your craving has destroyed your life. But God says no. God says to you, if you repent and if you come back and you begin to gaze upon the beauty of my son and ascribe to him the weight and glory and begin to to make him the object of your worship, I will rebuild your life from the ground up. That's what he says. Now, Amy and I, uh, we just recently watched a movie on Netflix. You know, again, I told you I'm watching more movies now. We just recently watched a movie on Netflix called Extraction. It's a new movie. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the movie, there's a, the main character. He's trying to rescue a kid from the slums of India. And there's a point in the movie where the main character becomes vulnerable and opens up to the kid. And he starts to tell him about how guilty he feels about, uh, about his son's death. And the kid says something so profound to him in that moment. This is what he says. He says, you know, uh, you drown not from falling into the river, but by staying submerged in it. I, I had to turn the movie off. Like I, had to, I literally had to take a second just to like let that settle in me. He said, you know, you drown not from falling into the river, but by staying submerged in it. Friends, listen. You need not stay submerged in anything today except the love and mercy of God. That's it. That's it. Stay submerged in that. We're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, it's important for me to to reemphasize the fact that, that there is a craving in each of our hearts that sin will never satisfy. And God has invited us to the marriage supper of the lamb that will be the fulfillment of everything you're looking for but you gotta RSVP you gotta respond and so if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to take up residence in your heart and, and, and you've never asked God to save you a seat but you want to pray this prayer with me pray this with me say Lord Jesus I recognize today your power and your authority over sin. I thank you that you you came and you lived the life I couldn't live. You died the death that I should have died, and yet you still give me the opportunity to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Lord, I ask that you would come into my life and that you would come and dwell richly in my heart today. Lord, forgive me for my sins. I repent and I turn to you today. And Lord, I I present right now to you um, all of us who, like Achan, are counted amongst your people, and yet we've allowed the inordinate desires and cravings of our heart more weight, more weight than it should have. And as a result, we're paying the price of it, Lord. By your mercy today, exchange beauty for our ashes. Lord, make us a place of holiness. Lord, we want to live on holy ground, not hidden ground. Lord, we repent and we thank you for the door of hope that comes only from your presence, from your power, from your protection and your provision. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, there's some instructions that are in the comments. And so if you raise your hand, so to speak, or figuratively, or, or you wanted to, please, we want to engage with you. So con- contact us. Please reach out to us. Let us know that you've made this decision. We want to walk with you in this lifestyle reality that is being a disciple of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.